Hi, this is Pastor Brett. Um, over the last seven weeks, our pastor's been bringing to you a series of studies on the promises of God. Perhaps for some of you, you might have been surprised at how many promises God has given to his people. Some of them have already been fulfilled as far as the promises, and some are still waiting to be fulfilled. Perhaps one of the most important promises still waiting to be fulfilled is his second coming, that of Jesus' second coming. Peter assures us that we can absolutely expect it. In 2 Peter chapters 1 and 3, he defends his viewpoint to those who are trying to undermine that very point. Some of God's promises were to us as general believers, to the whole group. Others were done, given to specific people and or specific groups. But no matter where the promises come, because God is able to assure all the things that he has promised us, we can be inspired and we can be strengthened in our faith. His promises allow us to have peace in difficult times and to rest from the worries of this world. God has the resources to make all his promises come true. What does the Bible say about us as Christians promising something to God? And that's the track that I'd like to take in the time that we have together. Um, do you know someone who's made a promise to God ever? Or perhaps you have? Oftentimes when we come to difficult crossroads in our lives, um, it's not uncommon for someone to ask God for a favor or, and give a promise in return. And that person oftentimes promises to start or to start something for God. Um, it could be as simple as, you know, asking God to help you pass a test, and in turn, you will study harder for your next test. Or it could be something more serious, and perhaps you um, negotiate in, with God to have your spouse stay with you, and in turn, you'll become a better husband or a better wife, and you'll stop drinking. There's at least four uh, cases in the Bible where we see people in the Bible making promises to God. First one is in Jacob, and then Jethan, and Hannah, and the sailors of Jonah. I don't have the time to go into all those cases today, but I will bring up one example a little later on. Now, in the Bible, the most common word for promise that is used is usually described as a vow um, or a pledge or oaths. And I'm going to give you the definition of a vow here. Vows are spoken promises made to God and are often made with some the help of some kind uh, that is wanted from God. So a person making a vow can offer a thing, or it could be an action or the promise of some future action. It's basically an act of trust between that person and God. And there's nothing inherently wrong with uh, doing that. It's not sinful to make a promise to God. But if you do, you need to be careful because there's guidelines given in the Bible about doing that. Um, I'm going to read from Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 2 through 7. It says, Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much busyness, and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it. For he, found, he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let your mouth lead you not into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the works of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, but God is the one that you must fear. So therefore is saying that we need to be careful when we make promises to God. We have to have the intent of fulfilling them and also the resources to do so. Now, where I say a vow is not the same thing as an oath. And it says in general, an oath reassures others that the speaker of the oath is telling the truth, whereas a vow involves a promise to God. So that's the difference between the two of them. And the New Testament explicitly says that oaths should be avoided. Um, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 34 through 37, it says, But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simple, yes or no. 
Anything more than this comes evil. So while vows are okay, oaths are not okay, and they should be avoided. Now, Scripture teaches the importance of our words over and over again, and that our words have power that we choose to have in our relationship. Um, and this is especially true in a relationship with God. In my uh, marriage ceremonies, oftentimes I'll bring up that point that their words have the power of life and death in their own relationship. And it's the same thing um, in our own lives with those we love and especially with God. Um, Proverbs 18.21 states, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. So our words, and especially our promises that we give, should not be taken lightly or given flippantly. Here are some practical suggestions to consider before uh, you make a promise to God. First one is, do you intend to keep the promise? Okay, Was that promise given under the pressure of the moment and forgotten the moment once the pressure was off? And when it comes to making that vow, the words of Jesus comes into light again, where he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. And that's out of Matthew 5.37. The second point that you should consider is, have you thought through the promises? Um, flippant promises can be dangerous. Take, for instance, Jephthah's thoughtless vow in Judges, chapter 11, 29 through 40. He is one of the four that I mentioned earlier. And in return for victory over the Ammonites, um, he promises to sacrifice whatever met him um, when he returned home that came through the door, basically. And sadly, it was his only child, a daughter, who met him upon his return. It's hotly debated whether by scholars whether he actually sacrificed his daughter or she was simply offered up to be a virgin the rest of her life and be childless, and thus he would have no heritage. Um, but we need to be careful about what we promise God. And uh, one of the questions you always need to ask is that, if I promise God this, do you have the power to carry it out? Do you have the resources, the time? Um, is it dependent upon other people, other things that aren't in your power? Or can you do it on your own? Um, we don't know what the future holds, and God does, obviously. So it's another reason just for us to be very careful what we promise God, because what we can do today, perhaps we can't do tomorrow. Um, and that's why God is so assured because he has all the resources and he can make those promises and because his word is going to stay forever and where ours may not be able to do so. So we should be uh, cautious not to fall into the trap of making a promise to God simply because we are fearful or uncomfortable. How much better if we simply claim the promises that we already have. But if you do need to make a promise and you find that you can't keep it, what's going to happen? Are you condemned? Well, no, that's not true. Um, the Bible says that we can come to him and we can confess our sins and we can ask for forgiveness and we can change our foolish ways and that God will still forgive us. And that's a good reassurance. Uh, so as we consider our promises to God, we should make our yeses yeses and our noes noes. We should consider our resources and we should uh, make sure it's not on the spur of the moment just when we're feeling overwhelmed. Um, and then we should definitely have the intent to keep them and then follow through because to do anything less, the Bible says that we are foolish and can bring um, displeasure on us from God. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. It was good being with you. Amen.